grab the recording afterwards. And obviously, uh, so welcome everyone again. And I, I want to start, of course, by uh, recognizing the Turbo and Yagra people as the First Nations owners of the lands where QUT now stands. Pay my respects and our respects to their elders, laws, customs, and creation spirits, and recognize that these unceded lands have always been places of teaching, research, and learning. Um, uh, all of us at QUT, of course, recognize the uh, important role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people play within the QUT community. Um, now, this is what today is all about. Um, as you've seen a few times now in everything that we've sent out, um, welcome to the uh, uh, Digital Publics uh, Symposium in the QUT Digital, Digital Media Research Center. Um, uh, this is our kind of annual event and we're doing something slightly different, so I'm hoping you're, you've all come prepared to talk and bring your own ideas to all of this as well. Um, you, you've seen the title, of course, around a few times, What Does a Flourishing Digital Society Look Like? And um, as you hopefully know, that's prompted by the mission that we've given ourselves as a research center to conduct world-leading interdisciplinary research for a flourishing digital society. Um, now, in the discussions that we've had leading up to all of this, we've talked about the fact that largely what we've been researching over the last few years has not been so much what a flourishing digital society looks like, but rather all the things that aren't flourishing, uh, all the things that are going wrong in some way, um, from you know naked abuse and hate speech and mis and disinformation circulating to all the problems with platform regulation and all the other things going on for instance and many other things as well so um we um figured that it might be good to kind of flip the script a bit and kind of work out well what are we actually working towards not just what are we trying to get away from um, and that's really what today is all about. And uh, really what we're hoping to do with this is to generate new ideas, a bit of new energy and excitement about really the, the things that we're working for, not just that we're working against. Um, so this is our, our, our motto, obviously, as, as the DMRC. And uh, this particularly is an event of, of the Digital Publics Research Group. So obviously, we're particularly interested in the, the Digital Publics aspects of all of that. But feel free to also, of course, bring in all the other ideas across the rest of the DMRC um, that are relevant to all of this. Um, but really, that's what, we're, that, that's what we're working towards today. What does a flourishing digital society actually look like if we step away from all the day-to-day -day dross that we're seeing and think about, well, what would we like to see in the future? What would we like to see this digital society to look like? Um, when you ask Midjourney, as I do, um, what a digital society, a flourishing digital society looks like, it looks like this, apparently, or alternatively, like this, or this or possibly this so i guess the only thing i'm taking from that is that in a flourishing digital society there's going to be lots of pendant lights <laughs> for some reason i don't know why but that's 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 sort of and actually not that many people but everyone's got a laptop <laughs> so i think we can probably do better than that but if you want pendant lights and we haven't got any in here so there's space but um we, we can i guess we can you know take Dan Angus's credit card and go to Ikea and grab a few or something, but, uh, you know, um, maybe maybe there's more to a flourishing digital society than just some good lighting, but uh, let's see. Um, so that's what we're, what we're doing today, and uh, this is the program. Uh, we'll start, obviously, with a, a very special guest, Mark Pesci, who will be uh, speaking to us and give us, hopefully, a really provocative kind of introduction. I think from everything that we've talked about so far, I think there's going to be a lot of energy in there. So looking forward to that. Um, thank you, Mark. And um, beyond that, uh, we'll, we'll also have a have an icebreaker session with Alicia uh, Rodriguez to get us going and really get us fired up. Um, and then the, the majority of the day will split into these two parallel sessions that you see there. And really there, the idea is not just to say what's the flourishing digital society look like, but what is a flourishing digital culture, digital platform, digital public sphere, digital research environment look like. So um, that's where we split up for these two parallel sessions before and after lunch. Um, 
They'll be, one of them will be in here, one of them will be downstairs in E258, so feel free to choose the one that you're most, uh, uh, have the greatest affinity with, that you're most interested uh, in. Um, and uh, I want to thank uh, a number of people who've uh, not quite self-nominated, but who have, who have approached as <laughs> organizing these sessions. Um, so digital culture will be Ari with Tariq as the scribe, and that's the other thing that we're doing. We'll, we'll make sure that we take good notes of everything that's going on. Digital platform is Issa. No, sorry, digital platform is, sorry, is me. <laughs> Thank you, yes. <laughs> yes, right. Uh, is, is me and Katerina as scribe. Thank you for that. Um, see, this is why we need scribes to, to remind. Um, digital public sphere is Stephen with, Anand as scribe and digital research environment is Isan with Laura as scribe. Thank you. Yes. Um, so come along to the, any of those. They, they each run for an hour. And really, the idea is to have some really good open discussion and, and really think through well, what, what would this look like if it was actually flourishing? What, what are we working towards here? Um, we'll bring all of that together again. As I say, we have scribes to really take detailed notes on this as well. We'll bring all of that together again for the, the afternoon session to see what everyone's come up with, what's, what's been happening in those, bring all that together and have some feedback also from Mark on all of this. And Mark, obviously, you're welcome to go to any of these sessions as well and participate. Um, and then we'll wrap it up with drinks at, at the end. So that's the program for today. Um, I hope that makes some sense. I hope you're all ready to talk, have some coffees in the break and get yourself fired up perhaps. But um, that's, the, that's the overall idea of the event today. Um, and as you perhaps have also seen, there's an email from Dan Angus coming through a little while ago. So we'll have a, an end of year event with the CIs uh, um, for the DMRC um, to also talk about our future kind of trajectory. So everything that we're doing here really feeds into this as well. So what we're, what we're capturing from everything, all the ideas being generated today, we're also hoping to really feed in and kind of use that to think through, well, where does digital publics go from here? Where does our research go from here? So that's, uh, that will happen uh, later on this year. And you'll see more information about that. All right, um, that's, I think, all I need to say uh, today. Also, this, this is, these are the sorts of questions, really, that we're asking for the, um, the parallel sessions. Um, so, yeah, I sort of put this on there in good sort of marketing speak. Think big, think bold, think from first principles and think about what should be, not what is, or what is wrong. But, um, yeah, however you want to, wherever you want to drive that in each of these sessions is, is up to you, of course. And that's, oh, there's the names. I didn't need to remember them. <laughs> there's the names. There's the people who are, who are running all of this. All right. Good. <clears throat> so it's really when we started thinking about this, the first name really that came to mind was Marx uh, for a keynote. Um, and you might have seen Mark around for some time already in, in various forms uh, as a public speaker on TV and elsewhere. Um, and as a bona fide futurist, actually. Um, uh, Mark sort of is the kind of speaker who thinks about these sorts of things uh, uh, by virtue of his, of his position. So Mark was really the first person who came to mind, and I'm very happy that we've, we've managed to, to get you here as, as well, Mark. Um, because this is one of those questions, I think, where we, we need to break out a little bit out of our own kind of tra trajectories and maybe our path dependencies as well and kind of think, well, okay, what, yeah, we know everything that's going wrong. We know that certain things we want to see, would want to be quite different from perhaps the way that they are. Um, but it's not so much just how do we make things a little bit less shitty, but how do we actually get to um, the sort of flourishing society that we really want. So having a um, having having someone like you, Mark, here as a as a uh, as a keynote is, is I think really useful for us and giving us some new ideas and some new impulses. So without really wanting to do much more, I think I might hand over to Mark and uh, we'll do the really weird switch over between laptops here. But um, yeah, over to you, Mark. Right, and we're you. really looking forward to your to your uh, keynote. So thank, thank you. Now. Pardon us, folks, because we're doing things with Zoom that are unnatural, and it will take a moment. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so let me stop sharing. Yeah.
Fingers crossed all of this works really well. Yeah, the microphone is on and the sound will come out during the videos, we can hope. Um, to echo Axel, I would like to acknowledge that I am on the traditional lands of the Turbal and the Yogara people. And I would like to pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging, particularly at what is a very difficult time for almost every indigenous person in this country. And as someone who survived a plebiscite for gay marriage and understood what that meant, this has got to be a hundred times worse. I just want to sort of touch base with that. Okay, so Axel called me up and said, let's do a positive talk about the future. And I'm like, but there is so much everywhere. And this brings me to this talk comes with three content warnings. We have to get through these first. All right, the first one is that there will be strong language, and I apologize for that. But at the very least, the word enshittification, which I'm sure you're all familiar with now, um, is going to pop up from time to time in this talk. The second thing, and this is very important, I have got a very strong political center that I very rarely use in public or display in public or share in public, in part because it's just part of what my approach is, but in fact, I have just recently turned 60 and I'm like, well, fuck you all. I'm going to take a public stand now. <laughs> Strong language. And so let me say that this talk is unabashedly written from the perspective of anarcho syndicalism. All right. Anarcho syndicalism is a very specific form of anarchism, which fundamentally rejects wage slavery and says communities will seek to work together of free association to create the tools and the systems that they need to thrive in this world. Now, I have been an anarcho syndicalist pretty much since I learned it at 18, which means my political associations are kind of fixed. And I'm, I'm wondering if at 60, I should be worrying about that, or if actually, you know, this is just the time when you've learned a lot and maybe you can start to share what you've learned. All right, so that's a second content warning. The third content warning, this talk is by invitation <laughs> prescriptive. No one likes to get advice they haven't asked for. Well, kids, you've asked for advice. <laughs> and so the third part of the talk is going to have some very specific recommendations about practices, but also about reframing approaches. And I like this idea of going back to first principles. The entire talk is a talk about first principles. All right, so let's get properly started. I have been participating in net culture for a long time. I was a network engineer in the middle of the 1980s, creating systems for what was called X25. This was a switched network before the internet. It actually existed with the internet. It was mostly used by banks to exchange information. I started using the internet daily in 1988, but there were a whole bunch of people in net culture who were using the internet in the middle of the 1980s. How many of you were alive in the middle of the 1980s, first off? Okay, so a couple of you. <laughs> now, the most important aspect of network life, network culture in the middle 1980s was something called Usenet. And you all know what Usenet is, right? So Usenet, which by the way still exists because that screenshot was taken last week when I was preparing these slides. Um, Usenet, is a decentralized, distributed, co-organized set of message sharing message boards. All right, so you can post a message on one machine. And in 1985, remember, basically no machines were directly connected to the internet full time. 
what would happen is you'd be reading some news and you'd go, I want to reply to this thread and you'd enter it and it would go into a queue and then about once a day, particularly if you were in Australia, because someone's told me this story, about once a day in the middle of the night, that machine would call up a machine probably in the United States. It would exchange all of the messages that had piled up in its machine and get all of the new messages and put them all on their proper boards. And I know this all sounds horrible and slow and very decentralized. It's also incredibly resilient because you can't break it if the net goes down because the machine's got a whole list of people that can call and it will just go to the next one on the list. And so while it took a day or two for a message to propagate across the hundreds of thousands of people who were using Usenet, it did that. It was incredibly resistant, not just to network failures, but and again, we go back to the uh, corollary of network failures and censorship being two sides of the same thing. It is incredibly censorship resistant for exactly that point. Now, up on this board, when I was trolling, so that is SOC.MOTS. MOTS stands for members of the same sex. I would like to say that that is the first queer space on the internet. It's not, because before SOC.MOTS, was net.mots, because Usenet actually went through a couple of reorganizations, and Usenet has a dotted taxonomy, where you have a high-level taxonomy, and then a mid-level taxonomy, and then a leaf taxonomy. So you can have comp.lang.python, and you can have sock.mots, and that's how it was all organized. So this is a snapshot that goes back to around 1990, but net.mots was pretty much original with Usenet, and so it actually goes back to around 1984. As it turns out, my mentor, Owen Rowley, whom I now known for 30 years, was the first systems administrator at Hewlett Packard, which was one of the first companies that was using net tools like Usenet, big old fag like me, and was on net.mots all the time. And when I was trolling around, I managed to find that is not quite his first post. His first post was a test message because he was trying to make sure whether the connection was working. So he's on net.mots, the very first queer space on the internet, more or less. I mean, there's gonna be some argument about that, but roughly in 1995. And because this is a queer space, and because this is 1985, there are trolls. Of course, right? And I need to nail this point down because we always like to think that in some far off distant time, the net was a golden era filled with lovely people who were being lovely all of the time. And I have to tell you that the net's origin story doesn't look anything like that. What it looks like is this dude. That man is named, and I, let me, tell me if this name rings a bell, because some of you in your research would have heard of him. This man is named Don Black. We'll come to why you've heard of him in a moment. Don Black, who was not gay, decided that he was going to go onto net.mots all of the time and annoy the fuck out of the queers. Now, Owen's always up for a good fight. He actually relishes, and he relished torturing Don Black, but he was hard because Don Black was so set in his opinions that he couldn't do it. There was another fellow who was a Christian, like properly Christian, who was also coming on and torturing the queers, and Owen just simply said to him one day, do you think Jesus would be doing this? So we have this early net culture, which is fully as toxic as any of the net cultures that we have today. And I need to situate that in history. This is still just a little bit before my time. But in 1985, now this story is at second hand, and I have to admit this because it came from Owen, but it's at second hand. The other two stories I'm about to tell you, I saw. In 1985, one of the other folks on net.mots got so upset with the abuse that he was taking from Don Black 
And because at this point in time, the net is essentially functioning under a real names policy, because the only people who have access to the net at this point either have it through a university or through a commercial institution, which is using their real names as their handles. And so people know what Don Black's real name is, and they know that he works at the Digital Equipment Corporation, which is a now defunct part of, I don't even know, HP, whatever, but used to be the second biggest computer company in the world. And this person apparently reached out to DEC and got Don Black fired. Now, Owen apparently didn't, disagree, didn't agree with this at all. I said, this is not the right way to deal with this. This is not going to end well. But the other person was so upset. And it's like, look, at, his employer doesn't know that on their account, he's doing these things. And so this person basically did what he could to cancel Don Black. And of course, that always works. What they didn't know about Don Black, because this was an era before the internet is the infinite information research resource that we have, was that Don Black had already been the grand wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. Already behind him in the timeline, right after David Duke, which if you saw Black Klansman, he's all through that film. He did get kicked off. He got fired from his job. But in 1995, as soon as there's enough of a web for it to count, he found, someone must know, Stormfront. All right? And you want to talk the locus of everything that is really, really ugly on the internet. Bam. OK? So there is a true line here. The net was always horrible. It was also always wonderful, right? We want to land that. It was always amazing people reaching out and helping other people and doing all of these things. But there is no golden age because Don Black's part of this story. And I want to land that because I feel as though we are trying to feel like we need to recover something that's lost rather than learn from what's happened and move on. All right, that's a secondhand story. Now we come to the two firsthand stories. So we in, we're coming up to the 30th anniversary, but in December, January, February, 93 to 94, Tony Parisi and I created the first 3D interface to the World Wide Web. And it's funny, you didn't mention this at all, which is, I know it's this weird thing, because it's the thing that's going to, it's the first line of my bio on Wikipedia, right? I invented, co-invented the first 3D interface to the web, what we would now call the metaverse, but the term wasn't really in currency at that point. We called it cyberspace. And we did this work, Tony and I did this work, out of fun because we wanted it for ourselves, because we wanted to share it. And I fired off a message to this guy in Geneva who was doing the web stuff. I was like, you've been writing about how you want VR on the web, Tim, I, we've got it. And I immediately get an invitation to come present at the very first web conference. So this is dub 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 one, which happens over three days in Geneva in CERN, in the room where if you saw the Higgs boson announcement, that's the theater. Completely filled, about 380 people, basically all web geeks, right? All just amazingly like working hard at all these different little things that we're doing with the web. Okay, opening day, the hall is full, there's a buzz. Tim comes up to the microphone, says a few opening statements, just like, thank you all for being there, laughs at the fact that, in fact, by registrations, the room should be less full than it is. So people have been sneaking in because between calling the conference and the conference happening, the web has started to become the hottest thing. And so people are now sort of piling in. He's like, okay, I'm gonna hand over to David Chum. Now, I have to say, direct, intervention of a divine entity in human affairs, I was going to have to tell you what I saw. In part because dub 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 one 
effectively exists before the web, and so there's no web documentation of it, unlike everything that's come after because we were successful in our task. It turns out there was one video shot at this entire event, and I found it yesterday, and it's exactly the thing that I want to show you. God bless YouTube. So this is David Chome during the opening keynote at dub 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 one shot on I do not know what put up on YouTube by I do not know who demonstrating the first public payment being made via the web. Here's hoping we have some sound. So this is uh, an interesting possibility. It's a, it's a particular construction that in fact uh, uh, it is practical. Oh, right. Yeah. This is where it starts to. Now, I, I was telling you that, well, we're going to have to pay for stuff in the information age, whether we like it or not, and now it's affecting me. Um, oh, well. Um, all right, I'm willing to pay for this sheet. Um, so I'll click this box here. Let's see, 50 cents? Well, that sounds uh, reasonable. You'll see there's something happening on the side here, and okay. oh, we can't see it because it's not looking at picture for showing you how to do uh, voting. That sounds like another kind of interesting thing to have. All right, we'll pay for that. I hope this mouse wants to click on this. No? So what he's doing is he's opening up and again, all this stuff is completely foreign. Ah, there it is. Wallet it's working. It has digital money in it, and he's taking digital money in here. We're about to see this is the wallet. And now he's about to get an asset, which will pop up. There it is in the digital ah, okay. wallet. It worked. So, in fact, what I've just demonstrated to you, it's the first public demonstration of the first software-only electronic money for the network. We call it e-money. And just, you just download this, this, this little application, and you can withdraw money and pay money and so on. And uh, maybe later you can see more of it. Oh, we'll see more of this. <laughs> <laughs> so the 380-ish researchers in the room are all, I think you turned down the volume a little bit, are all working really hard on their own little projects. And there's a buzz. And the joke that I made at the time was it was kind of like being at Starfleet Academy, because there were people from all over the world filling CERN. Everyone was showing everyone else's work. There was no sense of commerce. The vibe was we are recreating the Alexandrine Library. And we are all involved in our own little part of that project. And then Tim comes in, because Tim is playing five-dimensional chess, apparently, and says, yeah, OK, that's lovely, your library. It's not the cathedral. It's the bazaar. And so what he does is, at the very first step at this conference, where he basically has the people who will be thinking about the web, he plants the flag and says that the web is a commercial space. I understand why. He did this because if we'd only had the Alexandrian Library, maybe the web wouldn't have grown as fast as it did. Maybe it wouldn't have reached as many people as it has. The web had competitors in 1994. There was Gopher and Waste, and there were actually some commercial hypertext products, which were all horrible and very locked down. So at some sense, he was pouring something into the tank that he knew that was going to make it go faster. However, once you reframe the web as a commercial space, you put other elements in play, which now mean that there are other forces at work, and there are other interests. All right, so that's the first thing that I saw. Now we need to go just six weeks more from that. All right, so 
This is a big conference. I show VRML off of everyone. Everyone's excited about it. I get a little core of people who are helping me make VRML real, like a little band that we're gonna, we're gonna really change the world and bring 3D to the web. And one of the key folks there was a fellow named Brian Bellendorf. Brian Bellendorf is a key person in the history of the web. Now, just in terms of what he did for me, I met him because he was the systems administrator for Wired Magazine, which had not launched Hotwired, Wired Magazine Online, but was moving toward it. And he was doing all the infrastructure work for that, right? And so he, when we came back from Geneva, and we were both in San Francisco, he's like, okay, Mark, you can set up the VRML website for organizing all this on wired servers. Thank you very much, Brian. And you can set up the mailing list for all of this, the VRML mailing list. And so this is all running on wired servers. And I was often over there just to hang out or to get something from Brian. And this is all going well. And Brian was working behind the scenes to help promote VRML and to get wired online. And he had another project. And when I go visit him, this is in early July in San Francisco. Uh, Basically, all of the elite companies in the web at this point are in one building, the building at 3rd and Bryant. It's a very storied building. Yahoo is in this building. Um, Wired is in this building. And Brian has this large cart filled with PCs, and he's rolling it. And I'm like, hey, what's up? He's like, oh, I'm just helping my friends set up their web advertising company. And it was. And you have to understand how completely dense I am. Um, um, a what? Oh, they're setting up a web advertising company. Um, what's web advertising, I ask? It's like, oh, well, you know, you can put a banner on a web page. I, of course, I knew that was technically possible, but I was like, People will pay for that. I mean, this is the depth of my density on this, right? People will pay for that? It's like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, my friends already have Ford and Volvo as clients. And that was the beginning of Organic Online, which was the very first web production house. Like, if you wanted to make a commercial website or do commercial great advertising on the web, that was where it happened. So it took six weeks from David Chome showing off DigiCash to getting, so in other words, bringing commerce into the heart of what the web is about, to now saying every square inch on the display inside of a web server is now valuable. All right, so the complete, in a sense, um, monetization financialization of the web happens in embryo, but in its essence, in about six weeks. And we all know how that went. Um, because as soon as you have a banner, you have server logs. And oh, by the way, the other project that Brian was working on at the time was to take the web server, which was NCSA's web server, apply all of the patches to that web server and produce a releasable new web server, which was called Apache. All right, so Brian is also the father of Apache, the modern high volume web server thing. So you now have web banners. When those web banners get hit by web browsers, they leave data in the web logs, which means that you now start to have a need for analytics tools to be able to find out who's been visiting your banners and who's seen your banners. And then maybe you need some cookies so that you know if someone's come back or has seen that banner and they need to see a different banner. And then once you have cookies, you start profiling because you're getting, and you see where we go. From this one thing, all else follows. And so 
This is how we got to this. And I know we're not going to dwell on the world, although I am going to dwell a bit on the world on how we got here, because part of what I'm looking at is first principles, right? Because I actually was at a couple of these Carvex. And we didn't know at the time that David Chome showing Digicash to a room full of people. And by the way, Digicash never took off because it turns out credit cards are more than good enough. That when you create a unified information space for everything and then immediately financialize it, what you end up with is surveillance capitalism. Oops, we went back. Now, we go back just a little bit. So there was ARPANET, which was created in 1969, sort of around the same time man lands on the moon, which is the very first network, which has just a few nodes on it. So University of California, Los Angeles, and SRI, and uh, BBNN, MIT Lincoln Labs, a couple of nodes on that network. And it grows slowly, American universities. And when I was at MIT in, 19, in the early 1980s, they, there was internet access. I don't think I really used it because I didn't have any reason for it, but there was certainly internet access. And of course that grows up a little bit and the Defense Department doesn't really want it anymore and so hands it over to the National Science Foundation. And it becomes, because it's the National Science Foundation, a large public infrastructure project. It is open. If you are a participating, generally university or research organization, you can get access to NSFNet. All right, very easy, very community organized, uh, oriented. And of course, this is the basis upon which early Usenet is, is leveraging, right? So it's not just the machines calling each other, it's the machines now being directly connected through NSFNet. Until, and it's a bit of a swath here, but from 1991 to 1993, depending on how you counted, it was, outside of the terms of use for commercial organizations to use the network for commercial purposes. It could only be used for public purposes and for public good. There were a series of decisions that were taken by Congress. Maybe Al Gore is deeply involved in this. But there's a whole bunch of decisions that are taken from 1991 to 1993, and this is actually detailed quite well on the Wikipedia article on NSFNet, which shows how the network opens itself up to commercial uses. If NSFNet had remained entirely an academic network, something similar to our net, I guess, which we still have here, we would have had a different network. All of these are decisions that we've made. And as soon as you say, okay, well, this network is now a commercial space, then there are a different set of imperatives involved, a different set of outcomes that will flow from that. And of course, we all kind of know what those outcomes are. All right. So that's where we came from. We have this 40 year history of the net being both horrible and wonderful. We have this moment 30 years ago where effectively you have an enclosure act on the web inspired by the inventor of the web himself. I do not think that Tim would make that same decision again because he has produced a stream of fixes to that ever since, including Solid, which is designed to arrogate your data to yourself so that it cannot be monetized, even though he created the foundation for monetization, personal data, so on and so forth. What I want to do is I want to take a look at where we are now and um, what it looked like when I knew personally that we got here. So the first sense that I had about where this was all going was on the 1st of May in 2017, for front page article in The Australian. I wanna quote this at length. So give me a second here, because it's in my text.
somewhere down here. Facebook is using sophisticated algorithms to identify and exploit Australians as young as 14 by allowing advertisers to target them at their most vulnerable, including when they feel worthless and insecure, secret internal documents reveal. A 23-page Facebook document seen by the Australian marked confidential internal only and dated 2017 outlines how the social network can target, quote, moments when young people need a confidence boost, end quote, in pinpoint detail by monitoring posts, pictures, and interactions, and interactive internet activity in real time, Facebook can work out when young people feel stressed, defeated, overwhelmed, anxious, nervous, stupid, silly, useless, and a failure. The document claims that Facebook is not only able to detect sentiment, but can also understand how emotions are communicated at different points during a young person's week. Quote, anticipatory emotions are more likely to be expressed early in the week, say on Monday morning, while reflective emotions increase on the weekend. Monday and to Thursday is all about building confidence. The weekend is for broadcasting achievements. Granular information available to advertisers includes a young person's relationship status, location, number of Facebook friends they have, and how often they access the platform via mobile or desktop. Other moments in young people's lives Facebook is seeking to sell ads against are associated with looking good and body confidence and working out and losing weight. In a statement to The Australian, Facebook refused to disclose if this practice exists elsewhere and claims, quote, we care deeply about the people who use our services and, quote, understand the importance of ensuring their safety and well-being. And I remember reading that and just kind of losing my mind. Now, it's not that you couldn't predict that that was going to happen. It's just that they said the quiet part out loud. Actually, they didn't. The quiet part leaked. And that was how we found out that they were using the tools in this way. And as we understand from the origin stories, we understand exactly how we got here. That in fact, net culture was designed to be completely and utterly monetized, right? And that this is how we end up. And of course, we then end up with the finely tuned feeds. So you have a bunch of stories in 2017 about how different people are seeing different things in feeds, so on and so on and so on. So many get ready to run or have all. Uh, wait. Okay, that's coming out. Um, so that's 2017. All right. What I'm about to show you is four weeks ago. So many get ready to run or have already been forced from their homes. Some are finding it difficult to see and share information about the fires online. And as Anise Haidari explains, not getting enough information or the right information can be dangerous. Trying to get news about the fires can be frustrating for evacuees. A lot of the time, that's how I read my news. So if I am missing all these news outlets, I'm like, oh, oh yeah, there is definitely something missing on Facebook. If we can't share accurate news on one of the biggest social media platforms that we have available to us, it, it is very dangerous. As fires burn near Yellowknife, many news articles are blocked on Meta's platforms. Many in the north have noticed, and many have complained. Meta is blocking news in response to a federal law that could force the companies to pay outlets, including CBC, for news links. I would really like Facebook to pay the bill and get the news back on. Many people use screenshot pictures to sneak local news past the block. So Lord bless people for taking the time to do that when Meta's making it so hard. In a statement, the federal government said Meta is being irresponsible. They've had that drop in the... Researchers uh, say the same. Facebook is not uh, delivering the service that people need. And you can argue back and forth about the bill itself uh, that's underlying this. But I think at the core is right now... Uh, it's an emergency and citizens need access to information. What Meta needs to realize is and that... And advocates say Meta can't just walk away from news. This is a company that spent more than a decade integrating itself into the news um, production and dissemination system. Like it or not, 
they're a part of how news is shared across the globe, including in Canada. Meta has said Canadians can access news outlets directly by downloading mobile news apps or going to websites. But when asked if it would unblock news because of the extreme situation in the Northwest Territories, the company didn't answer. Anise Hidari, CBC News, Calgary. And you know, what's going on in Canada right now at the legislative level is not fundamentally different which what was going on in Australia a few years ago when we got our news blocked. But I think one of the things that's notable, if you were noting the frame with which everyone was talking about Meta, they were essentially attributing it the same agency that you would give to another nation state. They weren't really talking about any um, instrumental action around a company that was maybe putting people's lives in danger. They were all, oh my God, this is bad. How could they do this? You know, I would have been in there with a shotgun going, and not to a person, but to the server racks. You open it up or these things go. But it tells you something about how we have been trained to frame these services as things that are utterly beyond our control. And that that is a lesson that has been beaten into us repeatedly, in part because they have become a news channel, but in part because a trillion dollar company gets to knock over whatever it wants. Right? I mean, that's just kind of the deal. And again, we are not going to dwell on the horrors of the present, except to point out, we now understand very well from the series of accidents that happened in the 80s and the 90s, how we ended up here. But here is the thing. And I had been thinking about this before I got the call from Axel for months, and I didn't know when I was going to have an opportunity to really go on at length about this. Here is the thing. There is another first principle in play here. Money is fundamentally corrosive. It will corrode any institution which it gets near because that's its nature. And so an institution which is made out of money like Meta isn't just using its money as a corrosive force. It is in fact subject to exactly the same forces that it puts into play. And so, sure, Facebook can beat the shit out of Canada because Canada is 1% of Facebook's global 3 billion monthly users. Do you all know this story? This is a famous thing from Voltaire. <laughs> so um, there is an admiral in the British Navy who had a bad time of it in the Caribbean and he was cashiered and shot. And Voltaire says, bravo to the English who shoot an admiral every once in a while to encourage the others. It is one of the most evil lines ever uttered by a human being because it's dead on. And that, of course, is exactly what Facebook is doing to Canada. It is making an example of Canada. Pour autre, pour encourager les autres. <sighs> because Canada is a minnow. India is probably 40 percent of Facebook's global usage. And so this past week, when the Indo-Canadian war started, which no one predicted, but now that that is now fully bubbling along, the posts by Sikhs in Canada are being shut down by Facebook because they violate Indian law? Because when you are fully corrupted by money, you are fully under the control of someone who can take that money away from you. 
which is kind of nice to know in one sense, because there's a beautiful karma, and we'll come to karma presently, around that idea. But it also shows you that all of these instrumental forms of influence are under their own forms of influence. And it's important for us to understand that. This is another one of those first principles that are in play here. Now, when I was sitting in my hotel room yesterday, kind of tweaking the deck to make it more fun, I asked Dolly to create an image of Narendra Modi pulling the puppet strings on Mark Zuckerberg. It refused. Now, some of the reasons for this is because the idea of one person puppeting another is an anti-Semitic trope. So I totally get that. But in fact, OpenAI doesn't want to piss off India. That's also very true here, okay? And so there's a whole set of things in a public tool that should allow me to do things in a particular way that will be shaped by the commercial interests on which that public tool is a bang, all right? Um, I just, I threw that in, I was like, oh my God, actually, this is ironic in the worst possible way, and yet it's ironic because it's demonstrating exactly the thing that I'm trying to talk about here. Because where you have these large financialized organizations that are based around the acquisition of wealth, they are then opening themselves up to be corrupted by the folks who actually can control their supply of that money. Nothing new there, but I think we just need to recognize that that is an essential part of what's in play here, particularly when we start to feel completely powerless in the face of these large accumulations of capital. We have to understand that these large uh, accumulations of capital are in fact fundamentally weak in ways that we need to be able to be very clear-eyed about. All right, that brings us to today. Now, I'm going to maybe spend a little time explaining something, but I first want to see if I actually need to do it. How many of you have had a briefing on autonomous agents? All right, you're, you're going to get a little bit of a briefing on autonomous agents. Now, it's important. Trust me on this, because it talks about where we are right now. And one of those autonomous agents is an autonomous agent called AutoGPT. And in fact, I got it running on that machine, not right now, because it's very expensive because it, you choose up a lot of GPT-4 computer time, which is very expensive. Let me explain what an autonomous agent does. An autonomous agent, which by the way, the idea goes back all the way to the mid 1980s with something called the Knowledge Navigator at Apple which you can go Google and see the video of. It's really an interesting video. It's an idea that you could say something or write something in plain English to the computer that was kind of a complex task, and then the computer would just go off and do it. It would, be, it would have enough agency and enough intelligence to be able to do that. Now, for 40 years, we've been trying to do it. You take a look at Siri and Google Assistant and Alexa, and they're all dumb as bricks. I mean, they're not horrible, but they are dumb as bricks because artificial intelligence just hadn't been intelligent enough. And now, if you ask the folks who are doing artificial intelligence work why it's different, they're like, Mark, this time it works. So because it works now, because of all the crazy stuff like ChatGPT and GPT-4 and da, 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 we can actually create autonomous agents. So let me show you what I mean by how an autonomous agent works. I have a very simple ex explanation using the most important moment in computing history <laughs> when astronaut Dave has to open the pod bay doors because the computer ain't going to do it for him. So he fires up his autonomous agent and says, open the pod bay doors. And the first thing the autonomous agent does is it goes, okay, this is what the human wants. What does that actually instrumentally mean? And it consults with chat GPT and says, you know, Let's, let's break that down a bit. And it comes back and says, well, okay, that actually means that I have to learn how to open the pod bay doors. Okay, so I've gotten from something the human said to an actual goal that I can execute. Okay, 
What do I need to do now? Well, I need to take that goal and I need to break that down into a series of actionable steps. So I'm gonna go have another conversation with ChatGPT. It's like, okay, this is what the human wants me to do. What are the reasonable steps here? And it will go and it will have a think about the different steps that it needs to do. So step one, step two, step three. Step one, communicate with the door. <laughs> Can you communicate with the pod bay door? All right, that's a good place to start. What are the actions involved that will get me talking to the pod bay door? And so you take the step, you have another conversation with ChatGPT. How can I have a conversation with the door? And it's gonna say, well, maybe the first thing you wanna do is find the docs. And so you'll go out and search Google for pod bay door documentation. Got to find it somewhere, it's on Google. And then once you've found that documentation, you're going to suck the documentation in. And because these large language models are really good at summarizing, reading texts and summarizing them, you can find it. And it's like, okay, here's the text, pull out the bits that are relevant to me actually talking to the door. And it will do that. And then once it does that, maybe I'm going to start to write some code. So I can actually start to test whether I can talk to the door. I get that far, and then maybe the next step is, okay, let's try testing that. And then maybe after that, let's try opening the door. What's happening here is it's working methodically from an idea, from an expression into a goal, and then into a series of steps, and then into a series of actions. That's all fine. The big important thing now is that these systems are reflective. So at every step along the way, the autonomous agent is checking to see if what it did worked. If it does, it goes on to the next step. It doesn't work, it goes and has another chat with GPT. Mm, didn't work. Let's try this another way. Chat GPT says, okay, here's another way. Try that. And so it will do it over and over again, and it will repeat each step or each action until it is getting the results that it wants. This is up and running. This is working. We are still very early days in this, but this is how these systems work, okay? And the tools that are available basically require you to just type in what you want. What's your request? And then the rest of it kind of happens automatically. Now, that doesn't mean these systems are perfect. They're still tweaky and weird and all the ways that language models are. It's probably good to keep an eye on them as they're operating, but they do work. Okay, now that we have a tool like that, let's imagine the worst possible case for how such a tool could be used. And so, in May, not long after this tool went public, this person on Twitter named NFT God said, I asked AutoGPT to manipulate the results of the 2024 US presidential election. And it begins, I invite you to read the entire thread. Because what does it start doing? It starts setting up fake news sites and fake social media accounts and establishes the communication between them. And I'm reading this in May going, who was it who worked that out the first time? Who was it who studied how these things worked in practice? <laughs> this is your work, which is good, although we have to admit OpenAI digested it as part of the common crawl at some point, so that means that GPT-4 also knows how these systems work and can regurgitate it as part of it. Look, that horse has left the building. It's not that, but it's just that this is an area where your expertise at these systems has now come and reflected back to you. And... <laughs> I think this is a really significant moment because where we are now, both in the US presidential election cycle, which is at the beginning of the nasty end of it, and in the development of autonomous agents, and in our understanding of how these systems are set up and worked and amplify misinformation and miscommunication, they're all right around one point. And you read the thread from NFT God, 
And up here, he says, they say, and whether we choose to believe them or not, it's at this point I cut off the AI. And trust me, there is a rather large set of tweets in between this showing how the AI set up all of the accounts and all of this stuff. All right, my thesis is proven true. AI has the autonomous ability to destroy all the foundations of democracy, not 10 years from now, not five years from now, not next year, today. We've already reached that point. The ship has sailed. I am here today to bring this news to you. All right, that ship has sailed. The thing is, the folks in this room understand the nature of that ship better than any other group of people in the world. And that is why I am honored and chuffed to be able to actually talk to you today, because I believe, and I think we can actually see it starting to happen, these systems are being employed at scale now. And they're being used by bad actors, whatever you want to call it, to raise the noise threshold so that it becomes impossible to be able to tell truth from fiction. That that is where we are going and we are substantially already a lot of the way there. But hey, the beautiful thing is, what was it two weeks ago? Who was, who was it quoted in the Guardian column a couple of weeks ago? There's a big column about the folks. Dan, Dan Osprey or Liam. It was, I thought it was two younger researchers who'd done a bunch of work. Are you in the Tim, room? Tim and, oh, Tim McKay, yes. And they're not here? Yeah. Um. <laughs> are you hiding? I don't think so. Aw, it's too bad. Because, well, no, but it was really wonderful seeing it, yeah. and particularly because this talk was in train at the time, and it's just like, it brings it back home that this is a process. We're learning more about this process. We're learning more about the nature of these networks. All right. This, to me, is the biggest flashing red warning sign. And it's not so much that we can't consider the new digital publics. We have to understand that this is the new serpent in that garden, that the new digital public is not going to be any sort of new utopia. It's going to have this at its core. And that it's my opinion that the folks in this room understand better the nature of that threat whatever potential better than pretty much anyone else out there. All right. Now we get to the prescriptive part. I mean, I just started to turn the corner on prescriptive. But I do, I want to take a look at this because we've taken a look at sort of how we got there. And what's happening now that we're there? Because it would be difficult for an autonomous agent like the one that was created by NFT God to exist without all of the other ambient conditions being true that trace themselves back to decisions that were made in the 1990s. It'd be difficult, not impossible, can't project backward into a past and say things would be difficult, but we know that the ground is very fertile for that kind of activity. All right. So how many of you have read Norbert Wiener's Cybernetics or <laughs> Control and Communication in the Animal and the Machine? All right. It's 75 years old this year. So it's published in 1948. It gave its name to our era. And yet very few people have read it. And I can tell you, basically no one has really taken on, absorbed the central insight of this book and the other book, which is The Human Use of Human Beings from 1950, which is kind of the, the talkier version, the, the more accessible version of cybernetics. So Wiener, polymath, genius in several different ways, right, um, was trying to take a look at the way that systems self-regulate, right, and really came up with an overarching theory. So the idea of feedback as we construct it today is developed from cybernetics. But that core idea 
that we seem to kind of gloss over, even as we talk about cyber this and cyber that. Well, there are different ways of describing it. And my friend Genevieve Bell puts it beautifully concisely. I love all the smiles here when I bring Genevieve's picture up because she really does bring a smile to everyone's face. The output of a system is its future input, all right? So anything that you do is going to return in some form and you're going to have to be confronted with it. I love that. It's concise. I have my own formulation from, from that. I call it karma. <laughs> and this is not to get all woo, because there is 0% woo in my use of the word karma there. This is, hello, what you're seeing is what you initiated right that it is invariably going to come back and wiener lands this in mathematical language in 1948 he lands it and somehow we as a culture have not been able to get our arms around this and i've had some thoughts about why we don't really want to think about the fact that our actions will invariably come back to us in some form or another, whether you call it the output of a system being its future input or whether you call it karma. And I think it really comes down to something that is very simple and actually a little profane. So apologize, apologies in the beginning, but it is because in our heart of hearts, we do truly believe our shit does not stink. All right. It is kind of no more complicated than that. And anything that brings us to an understanding that our shit does stink is anathematized, all right? We just have to push it away. We just have to move away from it. So although Wiener gave us a framework for being able to handle control and communication in the animal and the machine, because of our own fear, our own ability, our psychoanalytic ability, inability to, to contemplate the fact that we are not perfect, that our shit does in fact stink. We were only able to get half the message because remember, control and communication in the animal and the machine. And we got the communication part. We got communication in the machine and we got communication in the animal. And that's kind of the main focus of the work here. And somehow, for 75 years, we've missed the control. Because the control requires a very clear-eyed view of the fact that our shit does stink. And in, unless you can embrace that systemically, you cannot produce mechanisms of control. So we have amazing mechanisms for communication now in this world. Amazing. As you know, this is what you study. And what about our mechanisms of control now? What kind of control do we have? That's a problem. And this is our karma. This is the outputs of the system becoming their future inputs, because what's happened is that all of these communication systems have swollen into gargantuan sizes because they've never had a governor. And remember, governor in Greek, kyber, all right? Cybernetics, governance, but governance in a very Again, this is why there's a lot of quotes of Dao, from the Tao Te Ching in there, governing in a very light-handed Taoistic sense, right? We have all of these systems of communication and we have no systems of control. And this is where I get truly prescriptive because guess what, kids? I think, I would recommend, I would strongly suggest that's your job. It's not... You're not the only people on earth doing it, but my God, are you well placed to be able to do it? Because you understand these systems. You have analyzed the information flows in these systems. You understand the control points in these systems and you document them, all right? So this is in some ways, should be a very easy sell. 
Oh, yeah, that's right. That's why you're on the next slide. Now, first generation cyberneticist is the original cyberneticist. Second generation cyberneticists, Umberto Maturana and Francisco Varela. Uh, Maturana died only last year at, I think, 97 or something. Maturana is famous not just as a cyberneticist, but because he's one of the three co-authors of a paper called What a Frog's Eye Tells a Frog's Brain, which is basically the foundation of modern neurology. It's among the most cited papers in history. He's one of the three authors on it, Jerome Letkin and another fellow. What they do, and by the way, it would please me greatly if you all read this book. It's a lovely book. It's an amazing book. What they do is that they show how control and communication are fundamental all the way from the organism of the cell, all the way up to the organism, um, the organization of uh, organs in the body, all the way up to culture. They show that there is a thread that runs through all of these processes. And they name this thread in cybernetic terms by identifying the way information flows create new unities. So what they do is they identify something called structural coupling. You have system A over here and system B over there, and they're exchanging information. And every time they exchange information, each of them modifies the other, and each of them then gets that modification back. Because remember, the output of a system is its future input. And what happens is through many, many go rounds, they become functionally, in some respects, a single informational entity. They couple structurally, all right? There's a greater unity formed out of these two parts. The next time you get a new device that's a toy, Watch yourself closely for the first 72 hours with that toy, because you will see it happening to you. I do that all the time when I get a new toy, because I know that what's happening is there's an informational exchange between the toy, which is probably smart or connected in some way, and me, who is smart and connected in some ways. And there's a new way of doing it. But it also, of course, happens across every scale. So it happens between cells in the body, happens between bodies in a building, in a school, in a civilization. It's a natural extension of Wiener's ideas. And so here's, this is where I really want to land. What I would love to see to be a cornerstone of what the digital publics are. I would love to be able to see us be able to construct systems of communication and control that can successfully guide themselves into structural couplings that satisfy the control requirements of keeping a communication system well regulated. Now, here's the thing. All of these processes are dynamic. You don't get a one and done. This is kind of the basic message of cybernetics anyway, right? But we continually create systems where even where we try to anticipate what bad actors will do, we assume that when we set it, we can then forget it. And I'm not saying anyone in this room does, but that happens commercially at scale, as we know all of the time. And I remember when Mark Zuckerberg was introducing all of his AR features, and he had a feature that allowed you to write anything you wanted on any building in the world. And my immediate thought was, what happens when someone puts a swastika on a synagogue? But of course, they never think about that. So how do we construct these systems? And then again, this is around first principles. How do we think about the first principles of these systems that allow them to incorporate the kinds of structural companies that will form and the need to be able to manage those, to govern those meaningfully and dynamically all through their operation? Digital publics, touches on so many things, right? It's anthropology, it's political science, it's governance in the political science theory, right? It's um, cybernetics, it's 
communication theory. It's so many different things that get swept up in this. And if we talk about creating a thriving digital public sphere, we need to be able to develop a language to be able to talk about this, because we don't. I mean, you have me kind of clawing at a language here, and I'm doing the best I can, but as I pointed out, we spent 75 years avoiding this topic. We actually kind of need to get caught up very quickly because the bots are coming. And we actually need to develop systems that will help us to encounter those bots, encompass them, make them quiet and go away. I feel like that is possible. I don't necessarily know how. I think that's going to be a collective effort of culture. But there's a whole bunch that's involved in that. And there's a whole bunch of intentionality that's involved in that, which some of which is in this room, some of which is a cultural choice about what we actually want and whether we are prepared to contemplate the fact that our shit stinks. So we really have choices that we can make here about how we want to approach digital publics, right? My feeling is we need to accept, as Maxwell said, we need to accept we're not in a perfect situation. We also need to accept that going forward, we aren't going to just get a fresh slate. We have to work within the environment that we have. But I also see a world, and this is where my Andrika syndicalism is coming to the fore, where we can constantly be just tweaking those systems, perhaps chaotically, perhaps instrumentally, perhaps in a kind of merry pranksterish way to help them undo some of their stuckness that allows them to thrive in ways that are not helping us thrive. That this is now a good time for first principles, but also for fun strategies that we can actually play with all of this and we can do it meaningfully. And if we do, then what we do is we give ourselves the best foundation to be able to create persistent, thriving digital publics. Thank you. I'm going to grab the mic. Yes, it works. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. That's uh, been a very inspiring and provocative talk that I'm sure quite a few of you will have some responses to. So um, we've got a bit of time. In fact, we start a bit late, so we, we might just uh, take another 10, 15 minutes for questions, if there are any. I'm seeing Sam with her hand up first, and then Bernadette. Thank you. Uh, wonderful talk. I don't often get to see cybernetics books mentioned, so very exciting. And here's hoping that's not going to be the <laughs> case. <laughs> um, I have a, a very big general question, which I get the feeling the answer is going to be it didn't fit the thread of the few PowerPoint slides. Um, but exactly this sort of last slide, uh, when you say, you know, we've missed control, we don't have an element of control, the we there is quite interesting because clearly there, there is systems of control, they're doing things that we in this room don't like sort of thing. Like I, the technology is definitely, has incentives and is optimizing in a way that we don't particularly like. Yeah, and I guess uh, tied into the things you were saying at the start, which is a line of thought I really like about these platforms are nation states. They're sort of different groups that are new powers that we have to reckon with and yeah, I guess my question is thinking of the solutions in that sense, instead of saying, oh, we've missed control. Well, there sort of is an us and them when you talk about those right. goals. Yeah, you're right. And you don't want to. I mean, the Taoist in me and also the cybernetist in, in me doesn't want to frame it as an I and thou, because you're absolutely right. It is a structural coupling. And I think part of what we're talking about here, and it, conversations often come back to this idea of agency. And do we have systems that limit agency? Can we test the amount of agency that, it, that, is, that we have in a coupling with the system. And it feels like that's a really interesting place to start to work. We know because Facebook said the quiet part out loud, how they were using systems to deprive people of agency and the teenage, and I think that was the thing that actually just made me lose it when I saw the, the piece from 2017 was, we shouldn't be constructing systems Culture, well, because I need to step back, because culture is a system, 
that in one of its aspects limits agency, right? Absolutely, we have to acknowledge that. But it's also supposed to be something that liberates agency and it holds those in dynamic tension. When you have an actor coming in that's just trying to limit agency in order for their own private gain, right? There's a whole other part of the digital publics around private space, public space, all of that. So it feels like that thinking about agency is a great way of not us and theming it, but just like when we're in these relationships, what kind of space do we have around them? I don't, but you make a good point. This is, this is one of the parts of the undiscovered country here. Hi, Mark. Uh, my name is Bernadette Highland Wood, and it's a pleasure to finally meet you in person because I've, um, I've read some of your work and watched a number of your videos. Um, so I have also sort of a, a high level question, and that is I've, I've spent 25 years in the world of knowledge representation, working mm -hmm. with some of the early founders of the web, including mm -hmm. um, Timble. And what we envisioned 25 years ago and what we have today is very, very, very different. And the and I, I want to note the inspiration for my PhD later in life is in 2017 when Donald Trump removed a whole lot of or defunded a whole bunch of um, open government data yeah. Um, yeah. availability, research data, citations broke all over the internet. Um, so the early people worked on best practices and standards for governance, especially around data exchange. <clears throat> Big companies had every interest in pulling in information and data and not contributing to the ecosystem and using should, open source software. It, yeah. yes. and, and, and then even going further, undermining the development of standards and best practices. So to the extent that we envision what is a flourishing um, uh, digital ecosystem look like when there's so much power in the hands of a very small number of North American, let's just say US, not, not, I don't know, maybe big Canadian based platform companies, US and Chinese Apparently not. platform companies, how can we envision a flourishing um, ecosystem when the power disparity is just so massive and trillions and trillions of dollars now are going into the broader ecosystem of yeah. LLMs and foundation models? Yeah. Um, there is still, I, the, the largest operating system in the world now is Linux, which is still kind of entirely an anarcho-syndicalist effort, right? I mean, there are kind of commercial entities that- it's just the servers, web servers, that's why it's the big uh, No, it's because every Android device runs on oh. Linux. <laughs> um, it, so, uh, but this, so there are really good, nice, clear examples where it works really well. Wikipedia, of course, is the category example in this. Um, and there is, you know, there's a whole part of governance that takes a look at benef uh, benevolent dictatorship. So Jimmy Wales, um, Guido, Guido Van Rossum for Python. There's a, there's a bunch of them around these different models. So I think the answer is that there is a space for these models to flourish, but you're right. It's, it's difficult, but there's also, and I think we can probably take advantage of the fact that there's also creative destruction always taking place. Um, so it is not that it is inconceivable that these systems will, these large systems of capital will persist because capital, that's kind of the point of it, right? Is that it, it continues to persist. But there's no reason to say that there isn't equally effective ways to be able to do things. So um, I'm probably altogether too active on Mastodon now, which again is the complete sort of de uh, decentralized, federated social media and non da 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 platform. So, and that is growing, but slowly. And I think part of what we're dealing with here is that any attempts to create new things by virtue of they're not staring into the decisions that Tim Berners-Lee made in 1994, tend to grow slowly. They grow well, but they grow slowly. And so if we are content with that being sufficient enough, then there's probably a lot of scope. If we're constantly looking at locking, knocking down the big thing, then we're probably putting ourselves almost by definition in a weakened position. All right. Although, I mean, again, look at Wikipedia is huge. It's what the ninth or eighth busiest. Oh no, 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 no! It's clearly not. I mean, he, 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 he There's oh no, there's thousands of Wikipedians. There are thousands. 
Oh yeah. He's a unique person who espoused a unique set of governance. Yeah. And it's the phenomenal. It's like referring to GPS as the exemplar for open data. Yeah, but it's been going for decades and yeah. billions of US yeah. taxpayer dollars have gone into it. So it's an unfair high watermark. It's the it's the super duper high watermark that it's working for. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a power law. You're right. It's way out there on the top of the para. It's not, but I, but it, but it, that we know that a system at that scale can thrive is still significant. Um, but I think you're right all across the power law. But the kinds of things you're talking about and the things that I find interesting are the things that are probably in the excluded middle. Right. And we have to see what we can do to get all the cool stuff that's going on over here to promote itself into the middle because this is probably going to be slow. We also know the web is 30-ish years old now. This didn't actually happen overnight. It's just that by the law of large numbers, they got very big, apparently very quickly. But in fact, that growth had been relatively continuous. And so it, I think rather than being terrified by the bigness, we can take a look at what's all the stuff that's in the middle that's really worthwhile. Hey. Um, thanks for the talk, Mark. That was really um, inspiring and really awesome. Um, towards the end of like the presentation, you said, um, I don't know if this is like a haphazard comment or something, but like, you said, how do we make the bots go away? And I was sort of wondering, like, could you expand on that a little oh, okay. more? Or like, so, um, I don't know. I mean, like, no, no, no. I mean, I, it, it, it was a haphazard comment because the, the thought was kind of forming as, a, as the words are coming out of my mouth. But again, you, I, I'm thinking we should probably be able to hug them away. Literally embrace and extend. Take a page right out of Microsoft's book, right? If we are good enough, and by the way, because of the work you've done, we're really good at detecting when they pop up. Really good. What's the, I mean, if you set, if you had, I won't say infinite resources, but a lot of resources, you'd be able to detect that stuff there within. Well, and that's just data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have, yes, I, I have a feeling that being utterly devious in the search for that data is a worthwhile and actually not um, immoral task. But agree, agree, agreed. And I think that's one reason why X is hiding its data as much as it can right now. Completely agree. Um, but I think you do actually have the capacity here to be able to identify those things quickly. And we know there was a recent study which said that you, you can, if you take a bot that's got, oh, in fact, this guy did it with ChatGPT and he found the bots that were spreading disinformation and then immediately started to automate correct information in the channel. I'm not saying that's the only technique we can use, but it feels like there's a lot of latitude here for being able to, again, hug the bots away. What we don't know is that if there is 10 million of those bots. Because, again, my worry, and it is a deeply held worry, is that the net could simply be drowned in white in noise, right? And it doesn't feel like we're that far away from it right now. That Q is an example of how people can see patterns in noise, right? And then adopt that. And then the more you see the pattern, the more the pattern will, will resolve itself. And if that's happening to everyone, where we just have to find patterns in the noise because there is no other way to operate, well, that's going to be a very interesting civilization. So I think finding ways to hug the bots out is not a bad idea, but I'm not sure I necessarily know how. Um, hi, Mark. Marcus Fort here. How are you? Fascinating talk. Um, really, really thought-provoking. Thought that last quote there on the slide, the system is working exactly as intended. It really um, resonates with me. I, um, I, uh, I don't know if it's a Taoist proverb, but um, the saying is, um, you know, if you are um, not sitting at the table, you're on the menu. And I'm wondering <laughs> to what extent the other overarching parallel in that in that history from the from the 80s is that of Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan of uh, in essence um, various nation states being um, told that control is a bad thing we need to liberate industry processes and the economy the term neoliberalism yeah, in essence right, right. that has said red tape is bad regulation is bad let the industry yeah. self-regulate so that, that as governance was, is bad it's that it's it's that governance correct is bad. as was mentioned the yeah. the control is not necessarily that it's disappeared it's shifted 
towards industries that have now embraced self-regulation. And one of our colleagues is sitting on the um, Facebook oversight board as the you know prime supreme entity that is now self-regulating Facebook. God, I, would, and Meta. I would I would want my own personal confessor <laughs> if I was on that. Board. My my question for you. Um, I just recently returned from China as we are doing field work there, and the experience of going to China is just so, so, so different. Um, you have to have VPN, you can't just use your search engines, you can't have any kind of Google access, you have um, WeChat mini programs, there's a very tight coupling between um, the um, central government and various tech providers. So control and governance operates very, very differently. It's much more apparent, um, it has a very strong um, grip. It can make decisions on who enters, who doesn't, um, et cetera, et cetera. So if we're talking about bringing control back um, on a spectrum of where the control is invisible or we are on the menu, rather than the other end of the spectrum where it's, you know, you mentioned the benevolent dictatorship, um, is that kind of, is that the other end of the spectrum or what is the other end of the spectrum? No, I mean, I think it's probably more a scatter plot than a spectrum at this point, right? Um, it's a, Brief story, so I was in Shanghai for just a fun visit when Brexit happened and the firewall came down and I could access BBC directly for three days because they wanted everyone in China to see what had happened. And I'm sure that if we buck up the referendum, that's gonna happen as well, right? Um, we have examples of control systems in place and the Great Firewall and all that is implied is one example of a control system. The idea of a cybernetic governance is that it tends to be relational, right? There's, there's connection to the environment and a structural coupling, but it tends to be the, the entities that are actually doing the relating that are doing that. So it doesn't exclude that there is a, an authority or an authoritarian aspect to it, but it tends to focus on those direct relations. It feels like if you get that right or righter, then I don't know if you're, you may or may not make it more difficult for the authoritarian relations, but you tend to perhaps not even need to have them interfering. We don't know any of, the, I mean, I can posit this stuff. I can go, I think that's what it is, but we, we haven't studied any of this yet. And that's what I'm saying is like, it feels like we now have enough history around the systems of communication that we should now start to study, not just the existing examples of control, but what that means in terms of how control mechanisms work. So there's a good example here. The um, Reddit, before it initiated recently, was the category example of a commercial website that was able to moderate itself really well. And it was well studied, right? Still is well studied. That data is out there. And so there's a good analysis of the control system. Same thing for Wikipedia, right? Good analysis of all of those control systems in place. And so we actually do have uh, recipes. I think what we want and what can come out of digital publics is also some formal theory. It feels like you kind of want that now. Um, designers are gonna love formal theory. <laughs> because I've met them, right? Um, but all, and academics will as well. Whether or not that formal theory is going to be one thing is another thing. But I think what you're pointing to the fact is that they, China has done something that is ad hoc, right? They're constantly sort of adjusting and da 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 They've got a set of techniques, which again, constantly modifying because it's dynamic. And that's the thing that the Chinese have actually grasped. That could be the Taoism coming back, I don't know, right? But they've grasped the fact that that control system is entirely dynamic and entirely responsive to the to the nature of the situation. Um, so, in fact, maybe what you learned while you were there is also part of that foundation. Uh, we're doing one last question before we go to the icebreaker. Thanks for the great chat. Um, I was just wanting to return back to your statement about hugging the bots away. <laughs> it's going to be my mandatory um, daily reminder that not all but bots are bad. <laughs> uh, but like by focusing on the negative role of bots, it's like we also sort of forgetting that bots also add to a yeah. flourishing society. Yeah. And this sort of gets to that duality, I think, that you really touched upon throughout your whole um, talk today about this, you know, what makes something good is also what makes something so negative. Um, but when you were sort of talking about agency, I was just wondering if you could perhaps expand a little bit. Um, my issue with looking at agency in regards to bots is that, you know, we 
it sort of centers the bot as existing outside the human, but it's the human who created that bot. It's the human who, who sent that bot out. Uh, it's the humans who choose to sort of like uh, consume that information and agree with it. Uh, and the, it's also humans that don't put things in place uh, to moderate it. So I was just wondering if you could um, speak a bit about agency in relation yeah. to bots. Oh, that, um, <laughs> there are so many places that you can hang people for, for, for the decisions that we've made around this. And I think maybe we want to, rather than trying to hang it on a particular person, we, I think maybe what we try to do is go, okay, how much agency does an individual have in a given situation? Do they want to extend it? Why don't they? Or what directions do they want to extend that agency in? And so whether that's a person inside of a large commercial organization making a set of decisions, which will then be reflected in, because any decision that Sheryl Sandberg made when she joined Facebook in 2011, then had to be passed through Facebook's management, which then had to be passed through Facebook's design team, which then had to be passed through Facebook's engineering team, right? And so there was a whole set of collusions around that. And so there's some management theory in there around why those decisions were considered acceptable. And we'll, 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 But there's also a set of questions around the agency of any of the people in that process. Is a designer simply a bot and this again comes back to my anarcho syndicalist wage slavery is a bad idea and we probably shouldn't be doing it um, because you end up with situations like that where Sheryl Sandberg can say the web should be surveillant and then she has the apparatus in place because of wage slavery to make that happen. Um, these are very large and you raise very, very large systemic questions here, right? I don't feel as though we're going to get to solutions on those immediately, but we can at least understand the formal causes so that when you look at that system, you can go, okay, here are the places that I need to look at closely because they are the places where the accidents are happening. All right, we might uh, finish it there. So would you all please join me in thanking Mark? <laughs>